In this video, we are going to learn how to evaluate line integrals of scalar functions. This is our first introduction to the concept of line integration. Now, we've learned how to integrate over intervals, areas, and volumes with single, double, and triple integrals. So our next task is to learn how to integrate over curves and think vector functions and space curves from earlier in the course. These are called line integrals, but a better name would be path integrals or curve integrals. The name line integrals stems from the fact that a line is the simplest curve that we can integrate over. But generally speaking, we can have circular curves, we can have parabolic curves, they don't have to be linear in nature. So formally defining a line integral, given a curve C, parameterized as R of T being equal to X of T, Y of T as the I and the J component on the interval A to B, then the line integral with respect to arc length, so respect to arc length now, of a continuous function f of x, y along the smooth curve C is defined as the integral along C of f of x, y ds. So pause here for a moment and just look at this new type of integration. First thing that stands out is we are integrating ds as opposed to a dt or a dx or a dy. And that's because we are integrating with respect to arc length, s being arc length. We are integrating a function of two variables. And that's notable because a single integral can only integrate one variable. So in order to compensate for that fact, the parameterization comes into play. So our ability to parameterize a curve in terms of t will allow us to redefine the function in terms of only t, reducing it to a function of one variable. And that's going to be important if we're going to evaluate these. So now defining it based on all our information, so our integral then is going to go from a to b, f of x of t, y of t, redefining the function in terms of t. And then we need to account for the ds and somehow replace it with an expression in terms of dt, since that's what we're trying to integrate with respect to. So if we remember ds over dt, which is the change in arc length over the change in time from our motion discussion, that's really just speed, which is the magnitude of velocity, which we'll write as the magnitude of r prime of t. So there are a few different ways to understand how to replace ds, but this is, for me, a good way to think about it, where ds dt, change in arc length over time, is speed. We know how to represent speed as the magnitude of the velocity vector, which is r prime of t. So then that means that ds equals the magnitude of r prime of t dt. So we can replace ds in our integral with that expression. Right, so really to highlight that fact. Now the magnitude of r prime of t really acts like the Jacobian from the change of variables we just finished talking about. And essentially, it's because the interval we're integrating over does not necessarily have to have the same length as the arc length of the curve. So we need to account for that fact with this value, which is the magnitude of r prime of t. So thinking of it as a Jacobian is a good way to conceptualize it. Now, geometrically, a line integral represents the area bounded by the curve C in the xy plane and the projection of the curve on the surface z equals f of xy. When the function is non-negative, so greater than or equal to zero, this can be thought of as the one-sided area of a curtain or fence. And thinking of it as a curtain or a fence just gives us a visualization to grasp onto. So if we draw this out, we have x, y, and z. So draw some surface in three space. Doesn't have to be crazy, doesn't even have to be the exact one I'm drawing here, but we have some surface in three space defined by our function f of x, y. We're gonna have a curve below it on the xy plane. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to extend that curve or project that curve up onto the surface. So try to draw the same curve as best you can there. So that's the curve projected onto the surface. And what we've created is this area. So if we draw a few vertical lines just to visualize. So this is the curtain or the fence that we referenced to above. And we're finding the area of one side of this region. So that is the geometric understanding of what a line integral represents. There's also physical representations of line integrals, and that's what we're going to look at at the end of the video. Okay, but conceptually, we are still finding an area with a single integral. It's the area of this region, which is like a curtain uh, between the curve and the surface. Our first example, evaluate the integral along the curve C of x squared y ds, where C is the line segment from 0, 3 to 2, 1. So the first thing we need to do is parameterize the line segment from 0, 3 to 2, 1, and then really kind of go from there. So the direction vector is going to be 2, negative 2. So then we could say x is 0 plus 2t, y is 3 minus 2t, and we also want to include bounds on t. And that's going to be important because we're going to need bounds of integration. So when we're forming our parameterization, if we can include t bounds, it's going to make it easier later on. So here, the point 0, 3 would happen when t equals 0. And the point 2, 1 would happen when t equals 1. You can plug into our parameterization to check. So we're going to say 0 to 1 is the bounds on t. So we can redefine this as a vector function. You can keep it parametric as well. It's really a matter of preference. But to keep with our definition, we'll define it as a vector function. So then r prime of t is going to be 2, negative 2. And the magnitude of r prime of t is the square root of 4 plus 4, square root of 8, which is 2, square root of 2. So this work here, we've established the parameterization. We found the magnitude of r prime of t, which we're going to need to replace the ds term. Now we can actually get into the integration part. So this is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared, so 2t squared y, which is 3 minus 2t. And then our ds is 2 square root of 2 dt. And I'll just emphasize that fact there. So we can factor out the 2 square root of 2, simplify inside, so 4t squared distributed, so 12t squared minus 8t cubed dt. And now we integrate. And compared to the integration that we have been doing, this is much simpler since it's only a single integral. So we get 2 square root of 2, 4t cubed minus 2t to the fourth. Evaluate that from 0 to 1. So we get 2 square root of 2, 4 minus 2. So we get 4 square root of 2 as the value of this first line integral of a scalar function. Next, Evaluate the integral along the curve C of y e to the x ds, where C is the half circle x squared plus y squared equals 4, where y is greater than or equal to 0. So we don't necessarily need to draw this out, but drawing it out might help us figure out the bounds on t. So we have the upper half of the circle of radius 2, and we want to define that parametrically. So that's going to require sine and cosine, so r of t we could say x is 2 cosine t, y is 2 sine t. Think polar in a way, but now it's a fixed radius, right? The radius is 2 here, so 2 cos t, 2 sine t. If we want the upper half of the circle, well, the bound on t would be 0 to pi then. And then we're going to find our prime of t. 
So that's going to be negative 2 sine t to cosine t. The magnitude of r prime of t, square root of 4 sine squared t plus 4 cos squared t, which is really just the square root of 4, since sine squared plus cos squared is 1, which is just 2. Okay, so we have the integral from 0 to pi of y, which is 2 sine t, e to the x, which is 2 cosine t, and then 2 dt as our ds. Now, this is a good example to point out that value as a scalar of the interval. If you think of the arc length of half this circle, that would just be pi r or 2 pi. We're integrating over an interval of just pi, so we need a factor of 2 to make them equivalent. Right? So a good example to really show what that scale factor, and it doesn't have to be a scalar, but that scale factor is doing. All right, so we can integrate this. Underline 2 cosine t, that would be our u in a formal u substitution. The derivative would be negative 2 sine t. So negative, and then we could either divide by negative 1 or just put a negative 1 in front of the integral. Either way works. Circle the negative 2 sine t. That would be your du. So we're going to get negative 2 e to the 2 cosine t and evaluate that from 0 to pi. So we're going to get negative 2 e cosine of pi is negative 1, so to the negative second, and then plus 2 e cosine of 0 is 1, so e squared. And just rewriting this, so we'd have 2e squared minus 2 over e squared as the value here. But this example is nice to show what that magnitude of r prime of t is doing when we set up our integral. The next question we have to answer is about the parameterization. Could we parameterize the curve in the previous example differently, and would it affect our answer? Because that's important. If we're coming up with a parameterization on our own, then different students might create different parameterizations, and it's important for us to know if we would expect to get the same answer. So use the parameterization below and reevaluate the previous integral. So now our parameterization is negative 2 cosine of 2t, 2 sine of 2t. So first thing, the 2t inside means that we're going to cover the curve faster. Notice the bounds on t only go from 0 to pi over 2 now. And the negative on that x component, we're going to start at a different point on the curve. So we'd actually start at negative 2, 0 as opposed to 2, 0. So repeating our process, our prime of t is going to be chain rule here. So 4 sine of 2t and then 4 cosine of 2t. Magnitude of r prime of t is going to be 4. Skipping writing everything out, right? We have square root of 16 sine squared plus 16 cos squared. Square root of 16 is 4. So then we can set up our integral from 0 to pi over 2. And now it's 2 sine of 2t e to the negative 2 cosine of 2t, then times that factor of 4 dt. Okay, so now we can integrate. Negative 2 cosine of 2t would be our u. The derivative would be 4 sine of 2t. So we need an extra factor of 2 over here. Circle the 4 sine of 2t. 1 half times 4 is 2, so 2 e to the negative 2 cosine of 2t, and evaluate that from 0 to pi over 2. So we have 2 cosine of pi is negative 1, so e squared, and then minus 2 cosine of 0 is 1, e to the negative second, so over e squared, and we get the same exact answer. So that's an important result. So let's formalize it on the next slide. Line integrals with respect to arc length are independent 
of parameterization. As long as the curve C is traced out only once, as T increases from A to B, and this means that the value of the line integral will be the same as long as we choose a correct parameterization. And that's important. Yes, we can pick whatever parameterization we want, but it still has to be correct, right? If we tried to parameterize half of a circle as t comma 1 plus t, right, it's not going to work because that parameterization doesn't actually give us the points on the curve. But this is a nice result, means that we can create our own parameterization. If we go back to the first example with the line, the line segment, if we halved our direction vector, and then we said t goes from 0 to 2, right? We would account for that in the interval. We would still get the same answer, right? So line integrals with respect to arc length of scalar functions are independent of parameterization. Line integral with respect to arc length of a continuous function f of x, y, z. So now adding a dimension in along a piecewise smooth curve c is defined as, so let's see, our curve now, needs an extra dimension. So r of t is now going to be x of t, y of t, z of t, still bound from a to b. And the replacement works the same way. So we're going a to b, replace x, y, and z now with functions of t. And then that's not a vector bracket, that's a parenthesis. And then magnitude of r prime of t, dt. Right, so if we look at a three variable example, evaluate the integral along the curve c of y over xz ds, where c is the curve defined by the vector function, r of t being equal to 3t, t, 2t, t is bound from 1 to 4. So this is a good example for you to pause. It's not going to take very long. Pause this, try, see what you get, and then play the video, and we'll keep going. Okay, so hopefully you made an attempt and didn't just wait for all the work to show up. But r prime of t is 3, 1, 2. Magnitude of r prime of t is square root of 14. Replace y, x, and z based on our parameterization. So we wind up with 1 over 6t. I took out the square root of 14 over 6. We get a natural log type integral, ultimately getting the answer of square root of 14 over 6 times the natural log of 4. Our next example, evaluate the integral along the curve C of x ds, where C consists of the parabola y equals x squared from 0, 0 to 1, 1, and the line segments from 1, 1 to 0, 1 to 0, 0. So this example, our curve is a piecewise smooth curve meaning it's made up of smaller curves that are all smooth curves that we need to integrate over. Okay. And smooth just means they have nice derivatives. They're going to work nicely in the line integral. So 1, 1, and then we connect our segments from 1, 1 to 0, 1, back to 0, 0. So this curve C has three smaller components. So we'll label them C1, C2, and C3. So the integral we're looking for is really, so this integral is going to be the sum of three smaller line integrals along C1, C2, and C3. So we're going to compute each of them separately, add up the values we get, and that will give us the value of the line integral we're looking for. Okay, so along C1, that's the curve y equals x squared. So parameterizing y equals x squared, if we let x be t, then y would be t squared. And we're going to bound that from 0 to 1, since we're going from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Our prime of t is 1, 2, t. So the magnitude of our prime of t is equal to the square root of 1 plus 4t squared. So this is our first example where we see the magnitude of our prime of t have a factor of t in it, right? in this case, square root of 1 plus 4t squared. So we're going to set up our integral from 0 to 1 of x, which is t in this parameterization, square root of 1 plus 4t squared dt is our ds, underline 1 plus 4t squared, 
the derivative is 8t. And we can put a factor of 1 8 or divide by 8. So circle the 8t is our du. So this is going to be 1 8 and then 1 plus 4t squared to the 3 halves times 2 thirds. And we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 1, which is going to give us 1 12th. And then 5 to the 3 halves is 5 square root of 5, and then minus 1, 1 to the 3 halves. Okay, so that's the line integral along C1. Now along C2, which is y equals 1, parameterize that. So x can change, so x will be t, y stays constant at 1. x is going to go from 0 to 1, so t will also go 0 to 1 r prime of t equals 1, 0. So the magnitude of r prime of t equals 1, which makes sense based on our discussion earlier. The length of the curve, y equals 1, and the length of the interval that we're integrating over is the same. So we don't need to make any adjustments. So here we just have the integral from 0 to 1 of t dt, which is 1 half t squared, from 0 to 1, which is 1 half. And then along C3, here, that's x equals 0. So r of t is 0, comma t. And since y goes 0 to 1, so will t. But before we progress any further, we're integrating x. And x is 0. So the integral along C3 of 0 ds is just going to be 0. So we don't actually have to go through any more of the work. So then I'll grab a different color. The integral of x ds over the whole curve C is going to be 1 12th 5 rad 5 minus 1 plus a half. And of course, we can distribute and combine like terms and make it look all nice. But at the end of the day, this is the value of this line integral. So our last focus in this video is on the physical application. So if the function rho of xy represents the mass density at a point xy on a thin wire shaped like the curve C, then the mass of the wire is going to be represented by the line integral along the curve C of rho of xy ds. So essentially, if we take our curve and imagine that a wire or a spring is going along that same curve, define the function as a mass density function, this line integral is going to calculate the mass of the wire or of the spring. We then can extend this to center of mass still, x bar y bar. So to find the x coordinate of the center of mass, we multiply the density function by x, divide by the mass, and for y, multiply the density function by y, integrate, and divide by mass. For the center of mass with these curves, hey, okay, whether it's a wire or a spring, you may find it to be a point on the curve, but you may also find it to just be a point in space. So determine the mass of a spring in the shape of a helix parameterized by r of t being equal to cos t sine t t, on the bound 0 to 3 pi, with a density function rho of x, y, z being equal to y plus z. So we have a helix-like spring. So just to draw it, not that we need to draw it, but I think it's a nice visualization. This helix would start at 1, 0, 0, and it's going to end at negative 1, 0, 3 pi. It's like over here. So it's going to go like that. Okay, so we're finding the mass of the spring that looks just like that. So we're going to go through the same process as normal. So r prime of t is equal to negative sine t cos t1. Magnitude of r prime of t is equal to the square root of sine squared t plus cos squared t plus 1. So that's going to be the square root of 2. So now we can set up our integral. So we're going to take the integral from 0 to 3 pi of y plus z 
So remember, we're looking back to the original parameterization. So this is y and this is z. So we have sine t plus t and then square root of 2 dt for our ds. So we can factor out the square root of 2 integral from 0 to 3 pi of sine t plus t dt. And note here, going to 3 pi doesn't cover anything more than once because it's the helix, so it's going up as we continue that circular motion. So we can integrate, so that's going to be equal to the square root of 2 negative cosine t plus 1 half t squared, evaluated from 0 to 3 pi. So we have square root of 2. So cosine of 3 pi is negative 1. So that's positive 1. And then plus 9 over 2 pi squared. And then cosine of 0 is 1. So minus a negative 1 is plus 1. And then 0 would be 0. So we have square root of 2, 2 plus 9 over 2 pi squared. And that's the mass of the spring that takes up that curve. Now just talking about center of mass briefly, the center of mass is going to be a point on the z-axis, right? because it's symmetric around the z-axis, so the x and the y coordinate would both be 0, and we'd find some z-value to put the center of mass at a point on the z-axis, which notice that's not on the curve. Uh, and actually to find it, when you multiply, you actually would wind up with an integration by parts, right? So if you did that as a practice example, you would wind up with an integral that you need integration by parts to do because you're integrating z times the density function. So you'd have t sine t plus t squared. So that's the concept of a line integral of a scalar function. Important that we kind of wrap our head around this idea because in the next video, we're going to bring in vector fields and look at how we take line integrals of vector fields. But with that, practice, and I'll see you in the next video.